All right, peeps, here we go. Uh, 3.3 threats to biodiversity, total world biodiversity. Um, this chapter took me a lot longer than I thought it was going to. I'm just telling you that up front. So it's not a ton of pages, but they're just very dense and packed in with information. Uh, total world biodiversity. Most species are animals live in the tropics. So there's more um, biodiversity in the tropics, which is why we focus so heavily on the rainforest. 50% um, of tropical rainforest have been cleared. The problem is also what makes them really good for biodiversity makes them great for humanity and to live in. And you don't have to put up with the cold and a bunch of other uh, things. So a lot of the undiscovered species are insects, nematodes, fungi, and bacteria. You're always hearing about how the species are um, basically like, you know, um, there's like they found a new species in wherever. And it's usually in the tropics. And usually it's um, like it's usually one of those species that we're talking about there. Sorry, it's early in the morning. Insects, nematodes, fungi, and bacteria. Um, I'm going to have you look up what is a fungi. Some of you know this. Some of you have a passion for it. So, um, yeah, love to see it. Uh, interesting enough, my grandparents showed me how to hunt for fungi when I was a kid, but um, kind of lost that ability. So, Technique of fogging equals spraying insects, insecticides on the tree canopy of a small area and then counting the dead bugs that fall. So basically they go like, you know, they have a helicopter over a tree or maybe not a helicopter because then that'll blow off the bugs and stuff. But they basically spray the top of a tree or a small area of canopy with insecticides. And then they just wait underneath as basically all the dead bugs fall to the ground. And then they're like one, two, three, four, five, and they count them all. So um, it's used to identify species plus count diversity. Is it ethical? Tell me your opinion. Is it ethical to kill um, bugs just to count and tell like the species and the amount of them there are? Uh, define extinction if you can. It's kind of morbid, but all species eventually go extinct. Humanity will be like this as well. Seen any dinosaurs lately? Me neither. All right. Um, the average mammal species exists 1 million years. So um, we'll see how far we get with humanity. So, um, but yeah, generally the average is they last about a million years. The current extinction rates, um, extinction rate estimates is 100 species per million species per year. So that's like 100 species per million species die every year. So if we have 7 million species on this earth, how many species die in a year? 700. In a decade? 7,000. All right. Um, extinction rate is increasing. More is hot spots than other zones. Um, I should probably change that to more. more in hot spots than other zones. I'll use proper English for that. So even in the tropics, there's hot spots where uh, there's just a lot happening. There's a lot of biodiversity. It's really good, really cool. And unfortunately, in these areas, the extinction rate is going up too. So uh, tropical rainforest coral reefs are excellent examples of these. Animals that we hunt or are dangerous to ourselves or crops are more vulnerable. Think of it like this way. Tigers. If you're in India and you have to worry about your son or daughter getting eaten by a tiger or them destroying your food source, guess what? You're probably going to kill Mr. Tiger. Take care of the problem. Yep. Um, we do that quite a bit with our with animals that are um, nuisance animals as well. It does not work so much with mice and like other animals in my opinions that are more vermin we call them but it's because the reproduction rates are so high you know so mice are pretty much nature's potato chips though um for hawks <clears throat> you know eagles foxes they kind of need those mice because that's their food source 
Um, trouble is with habitat disappearing, extinction rates will only go up. That sentence right there, really big. As you know, like, as we start getting rid of habitat, the extinction rates only going to go one way. Estimates are that protecting 5% of the habitat could preserve 50% of the species, which is good. So if we, and I'm going to say bang for our buck, it's in the tropics. You're going to start looking tropical rainforest. You're going to look at those hot spots. If you can serve 5% of them, you're literally going to save 50% of the species. So factors that help to maintain biodiversity, uh, complexity of the ecosystem. The more complex it is, like, you know, with like a few food web, if all it is, is like, uh, 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 like that. Man, one hit in that card deck is going to fall right over. If you got a very broad base, though, where there's a lot of different things that the next trophic level eats, and then the next trophic level eats, and then the next trophic level eats, so it's like tall and wide, very complex, um, it's able to sustain different changes. So uh, bigger food webs equal more resilient if a species is lost, because if a species is lost, the other ones around it kind of make up for it. So stage of secession, initially colonization, not many species are in there. There's very few colonizers. Um, more species come over time though, as the soil starts getting better. Basically in younger habitats, species are more at risk. So when you got a habitat just starting off, it's real easy to wipe out those um, populations so or species. Which is why if you're on the top of a mountain and it's kind of like rocky, tundra-esque kind of, um, why they're like, don't step on the lichen and whatnot, because just that habitat, it's very fragile. It's not, if the da lichen is damaged, it's not likely to come back. So it's really easy to do it in. Um, limiting factors, necessary raw materials for growth. Take these away and species deplete. So um, you basically are, only going to be able to hang around an area as long as you survive there. What allows you to survive there is the raw materials that you need to survive. So water, food, shelter too. So if you don't have those, guess what? You ain't hanging around because you'd be dead. Um, inertia, property of an ecosystem to resist change from a disruptive force. So It's like the ability to bounce back, basically. Um, resilience, you know, inertia. So uh, factors that lead to loss of biodiversity. Natural hazards can do this. Hurricanes, tsunami, earthquake, volcanoes, wildfires. Hmm. Things along that nature. Interesting, but natural hazards often become natural disasters when they impact humans. So we usually don't care too much about um, natural hazards until they affect us. And then it's like, oh, my God. All right. Um, for natural disasters. No one really cares about the wildfire until they tell you you got to evacuate your house. You know, Um Name two types of natural disasters. I think we just named a few there. Um, environmental disaster are caused by human activity. So, um, in fact, let's do this. Um, I'm going to add something in here. Ohio train derail. Mint 2023. Tell me about it. And we're going to go highlight there, green. Yeah. All right. I might have it down here. Biggest cause of biodiversity loss is, um, oh, actually I actually have it down here. Never mind. My fault, peeps. All right. Biggest cause of biodiversity loss is habitat loss. So that's the number one cause of like people, plants, you know, animals going extinct. If we lose our habitat to live, you lose your home, you're not going to live long. 
It's heavily populated areas. Habitat loss is pre is prevalent. So we have a lot of animals around. In, um, it puts a lot of stress on that ecosystem and it makes the habitat basically break down. So fragmentation of habitat uh, is large area is divided into smaller pieces by roads, town factories, fences, fields, pipelines, et cetera, basically uh, geographic barriers. So when you have a large p area for animals, but then you build a road, a highway that they can't cross. Now you suddenly have like two smaller habitats, which it's when the habitat is smaller, genetic diversity, it can't really breed back and forth. So the result is that um, it is that gene pool gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And the likelihood of one or both going out is much more prevalent. So um, yeah, fragments become isolated. Fragments can get smaller. Edges of fragments become less habitable. So as you have these fragments here, instead of it being this like big juicy center here where like animals can live without really a whole lot of impact from humans, now you have a much smaller center and you have a lot more edge. So when there's a lot more edge, there's a lot more ability for human impact to occur. So um, can have invasive uh, invasion of invasive species, which will take over quicker if it's a smaller habitat, domestic and wild species can cross spread diseases. Yep, your pet diseases can go right on over to the wild animals and the wild animal diseases can go right on over to the pets. So that is a problem. Uh, pollution, local uh, pesticides that drift for, to neighboring areas, oil spills. So yeah, there's different types of pollution. One is local like that, or it's um, obviously, yep, it's a local problem. Um, you know, where you basically have like a dump, all right? Dump the, the toxins leach into the soil, all right? That is more of a local problem. Uh, as long as it doesn't enter the ground, as the water, and which then can travel. Um, emissions, effect is global. So here in Connecticut, we've got state emissions. Great, right? The only problem is the wind blows in from the west, and basically all those emissions from New York City come right on up into Connecticut. So we're not so much dealing with like our emissions, you know, although we are, you know, car exhaust is a big thing, but we have to deal with a lot of the car exhaust that comes from other areas like the New York City area. So runoff fertilizers. You ever hear the thing about poop rolls downhill? Yep. Well, guess what? It eventually hits a stream and then it runs down to the stream and the nitrous gins in the poop make it great for um, fertilizer. It also makes it great for algae blooms and for other problems as well downstream. So what was the chemical in the 2023 Ohio de train derailment? That's interesting. Is that a local problem? I don't think so. That tends to be more national, which is why you're getting Joe Biden out there talking about it. Mm. Yeah. Tell me what overexploitation is. Um, some would say we're, I'm over exploiting you guys for doing this work, you know, asking you too much chainsaws to take down trees. That's an example. We used to use hand saws, not anymore. We use chainsaws. Now we can take down trees a lot faster, better at it. Big factory ships with sonar to catch fish. It's no longer out there. Just you with a rod or you with a net, just casting, coming on back. Hopefully you get some fish. Uh, -uh man, we have ships with sonar. We go out there, we hunt down those big schools of fish and we just catch them all. And we don't, some of them we don't even eat, but we catch them all anyway. All right. Humans are basically uh, too, let me fix that there, too efficient at catching and harvesting resources, food. We're literally just too dang good at it. We are like the natural dubs on the food chain. You know, just we win all the time. Um, and it's not really fair because is it still a league it, or like think of it as your sports leagues. Is it still a league if the same team wins every year the championship and the other teams just get worse and worse and worse? They keep getting blown out every game. People stop watching. So not much in the way of competition. Um, 
if we're taking more than can be naturally replenished, then it's not sustainable. Basically, if we're taking in, if like more is going out than is coming in, that is not sustainable. More going out, less coming in means it's not sustainable. If you take less out and then you got more coming in, that means it's sustainable. I don't care if you're talking about an engine or if you're talking about um, food, I don't get like just anything in this world. It's input versus output. Um, tough part is determining what that, that what this number is. So that's very subjective, very arbitrary. And a lot of people are going to argue about it. So, yep. Rural poverty mixed with technology and skills makes it more likely to overexploit. I'm going to talk, I can talk about this in other countries. I could talk about in the United States even too. Um, rural poverty. So if you are in a third world nation and you are faced with trying to save the environment or feeding your family, guess which one you're going to do? You're going to do, choose survival, feeding your family, and then you worry about the environment later. Here in the United States, um, somewhat of the same. You have a certain amount of money that you need to survive. And to, if you have very limited options in your area, which can be true in rural communities, and you are faced with a mining job, which will pay you well, or a logging like job that just clear cuts you're not, it's a rich man who can afford their morals. So you're going to then start chopping down trees. You're going to go mining. You're going to do whatever it takes for you to earn that economic status and be able to survive and provide for your family, which is if you start looking at economic opportunities, look at some of the poor communities in America and look at how a lot of them are rural. So, um, and of course, you ain't going down like that. So, you know, you're going to use your technology, you're going to use your skills, you're going to use chainsaw, like whatever you got to start making some money. So introducing non native exotic species, I, you know, sometimes it works out. Hey, look, Sir Francis Drake brought back potatoes to England. All right. You could even name me like, a, like a dish from in from Europe that involves potatoes from every country. All right. Um, look at Britain, fish and chips, Ireland, potatoes, please come on. Um, in uh, Spain, there's tortilla, I believe. Um, in France, there's palm frites. Yeah, I'm, I could just keep going on. All right. Uh, Germany, I think there's potato dumplings. So, yeah, it keeps going on. Oh, uh, Ireland is called Conan, too. So, uh, let's see where we're at here. Oh, rubber trees from the Amazon to Southeast Asia. That works out. All right. That's, um, provided a lot of economy to the area and also some biodiversity and it cuts down on transportation costs because China, Japan, they all need rubber and to get rubber from the Amazon over there, a lot of fuel expended with that. So not really the best. Sometimes it can also be a disaster, rhododendrons. My mother had one in her front yard. It was beautiful. Unfortunately, it comes from uh, Nepal and it now competes the native plants in Europe. So no buenos on that one. Dutch elm disease came to Europe from imported from American logs. So basically they brought American logs lumber over from America to Europe and on it had Dutch elm disease. Great environment for it. They had no... Uh, ability to withstand it. So yep, took on over. Um, tell me about an invasive species of, or of plant or animal in Australia, Hawaii, Jamaica, Florida, or Puerto Rico. I picked those ones just because from each one, there's one that I can identify. So spread of disease may decrease biodiversity. Domestic pet diseases can spread to wild and vice versa. So just like pets can spread disease to the wild animals, wild animals can spread it to uh, your pet. So uh, dense populations are more at risk of disease. Think about this with COVID. 
This is why we did not, we shut down schools, the mall, lockdowns in general. It was because if you got a lot of people together, they're going to spread the disease. When you spread them out, like, okay, stay in your gosh dang house. You are less likely to spread that disease. Um, give two that make disease transmission spreading more likely in zoos. So guess what peeps, if you're listening to the, me, it's the dense population at a zoo. And it's also how you have, um, different species and how the disease can mutate and then transfer species. So what animal was impacted by the avian flu 2023 chicken? How would this impact a person's business if they made desserts? It's tough to make desserts without eggs. Eggs are pretty important. Eggs come from chickens. Uh, vulnerability of tropical rainforest. More animal and plant diversity than other areas of uh, equal land mass. So being lost quicker than other environments. Second biggest resource after oil is logging and logging is huge in the rainforest. Mm. So what makes the rainforest so damn vulnerable when it's got so much biodiversity? It does have more biodiversity than like per square area than any other area that I can think about. Um, it's the reason why it's being lost is because you can do really quick farming with it and there's a lot of population down there. So there's a lot of population with need and this is a quick supply of that need. So logging also a lot of like mahogany is a tree that we get from the tropics. It's a big tree. It grows, you know, it takes a while to grow and the wood is very rich looking and it's sought after by a lot of people. And it's not very sustainable, I my opinion, but it does bring some bread. So if you're poor down there, you're going to chop down your mahogany tree, sell that thing off for some bread. So um, the word bread, by the way, is synonym in our world is money. So um, so yeah, logging is very big. Shifting cultivation. This is how they basically farm down in the, the tropics because uh, there's a major problem with it. But it is sustainable if you have a small population. So with low pop, so low population density. Clear a small area of forest, usually by burning it. Okay. Uh, once you burned it, you can grow crops there for two to three years until the soil becomes depleted. Then the rain washes it away. It doesn't have any nutrients in it. Um, then you move on to another small area, you burn it and you repeat, you live there for two to three years. And, um, while the original area takes a hundred years to grow back. All right. So you ain't coming back in your lifetime. Maybe your kids will, maybe your grandkids, but yeah, you ain't farming that area until it grows back. So the problem is there's too many people, too much of a population density. And the areas aren't growing back before we're just burning them again. And obviously if they haven't grown back, the nutrients in the soil aren't as rich. And then you can't really farm there for two to three years. The soil gets depleted that much faster and then you're burning a new area. So it's just like <laughs> exponential growth. So, um, estimates are, it takes a thousand years for a cut tropical forest to regain the diversity of a primary forest which is why it is so important that like we don't touch these forests that have never been touched before in the tropics. Like the, in Puerto Rico, there's some trees that I believe are older than Christopher Columbus. All right. Don't go chopping them down. Don't go, you know, let them be. We have enough forests that we should have regrown over those hundreds of years. And if we didn't, we need to plant some more. So go after those forests. All right, but not the primary ones. Um, tropical forests are diverse because of the abundance of heat, light, and water. It also makes it very good for humans to grow there. So different vertical levels of the forest. Um, you know, so you've got like the ground level, tree level, uh, canopy, and above canopy level. So you just, the different vertical levels. 
Uh, fast growth and fast decomposition. So when that tree falls, the bacteria are like, and they eat it up really fast. The plants down there, they, they grow all year round too. So you've got a lot of tree growth and the gr plants grow really fast. They come back really fast. After a hurricane hits, um, the forest really, you don't even, it gets demolished pretty much, but it grows back really fast. Uh, however, most nutrients are locked up in the plants and not in the soil or leaf debris, which is why when you clear cut and burn, that soil is only good for, even if you, no matter, the soil is only good for two to three years before it's all used up. Once plants are cleared, soil is crap quickly and free, uh, it basically turns to crap pretty quick in two to three years and then the rain just washes it away. What makes the species prone to extinction? So a narrow geographic area, um, a range. So um, species only live in one place, fish in a lake drying up or animals on an island. Those are examples of narrow geographic range or area, small population size or declining numbers, low genetic diversity, so less genetic diversity equals less resilient to change. The more animals you have, the more ability you can like, one of them is going to adapt and change. So the less animals you have, less of the less ability to change. Also too, there's more inbreeding. Inbreeding does not equal long-term success. So happens with large predators sometimes because there's only so many up at the top and like, you naturally want to procreate and recreate. And if all you have is your brother or sister there, they're probably going to do it. So uh, low population densities in large territories. So this is where you've got like one mountaintop and like you got like miles away, another mountaintop. Um, habitat fragmentation restricts meeting breeding of species. So like the giant panda. So when you got when you're living like far away and there aren't many of you, the chances of you meeting and breeding are slim. So a few populations of the species, if only one population is left, not going to happen. Example, lemurs. So if you've got like two populations and they can kind of like cross and like breed and like this, you have diversity. When there's only one population left, it's just a matter of time before it gets smaller, 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 smaller. So uh, a large body, big predators usually need a lot of range, a lot of food, and they also have a low population. Uh, big predators can also be hunted down by humans because they start creeping in on our drip and just, you know, our world and affecting us. So guess what, Mr. Tiger? Got to go. Um, low reproductive potential. Reproduction, not often and not much. So some animals get together a lot and they reproduce a lot. That's what they do. All right. Other ones are more shy. They're like, Ooh, you know, I don't have a dating app. Okay. Um, like I don't really get together with the other species, my own species. Sorry. And I, uh, definitely don't get together with the uh, opposite gender of my opposite species. Uh, maybe it takes me a while to sexually mature and, uh, maybe I just don't have very many offspring. Those ones right there, low reproductive potential. All right. Um, not often, not much. Takes a long time to recover. Whales, large seabirds. So uh, whales got to swim all over the ocean looking for a mate. All right. And when they do, they have only one or two. And then it like takes a while for the whale to sexually mature and then reproduce. So yeah, they don't bounce back too quickly. Seasonal migration migrants. These ones are kind of weird because you need two habitats to survive. If one goes down, your likelihood of survival is not good. So journey is tough and it kills its share. You know, you try going from Canada all the way down to Central America without an, an airplane. It's going to do a number on you. So barriers can interfere with it. In the case of salmon, when we build dams, they can't get back up river to breed. So um, African herbivores following the rain. That's another example. 
of uh, seasonal migrants. Poor dispersers, ability to move, plants and flightless birds. So look, it's not the biggest and strongest that survive, it's the most adaptable. And up there with adaptation, and this is the ability to move, ability to shift, ability to like go in where it is good. And if you don't have that ability, the likelihood of you surviving just decreased. So specialized feeders or niche requirements. Giant panda eats bamboo in central China. So it's specialized to that area. It's like, nope, this is what I do. That's the area I live in. This is my food and I'm not adapting. Guess what? It makes it less likely for survival. Uh, koalas eats eucalyptus in southwestern Australia. Uh, does not have a passport, so it's not leaving Australia anytime soon. Doesn't swim. So, yeah, man, you're stuck on Australia. And where are you going to find eucalyptus in Australia? Southwestern part. So that's where you're limited to. Sundew and pitcher plants. You need damp bogs. The less damp bogs we have, the less we have for pitcher plants. So edible to humans and herding together. Ooh, as soon as you are edible to humans, watch out avocados i never had one growing up i live in uh, northeast america now that we've had them we've discovered things like guacamole oh my god the, the avocado trade from mexico is unbelievable mm. yep uh where were we right here over hunting over harvesting so especially if humans animals are in high density they eat a lot so if you bring in a whole bunch of bison onto a grass plane guess what that grass plane is going to take a beating and then the bison are going to move on so tigers and plants are um more like this tigers mostly for over hunting plants from us overeating so island organisms population is usually small this is like if you're on an island, it does not matter if you're on an island or a mountaintop or just someplace where you're, you can't really get off of very easily. Usually can only survive on the island. You're endemic. Genetic diversity is usually low. So yeah, there's a lot of different like inbreeding that's going on. And we all know how genetic diversity low usually does not equal survival. Um, vulnerable to invasive species. Then you get invasive species that comes in and you don't really adapt or very well to anything so guess what you're pretty much prey and you're gonna get uh, done out the dodo is an example of it if you want to look that one up go for it all right minimum viable population size equals number of species necessary to survive in the wild this is very subjective and arbitrary and people go back and forth uh large carnivores the number is thought about to be 500 once you dip below 500 survival ain't looking good all right uh they do this quite a bit for like fish for intake they'll tell you like okay fish has to be like this fish species has to be 20 inches to in order for you to keep or you can't keep any of this spe uh fish species um also too for deer if you're a deer hunter they'll give you a tag for a buck but meaning like shoot a male deer all right do not shoot female because females are right, you can have one male you got five female and the result is you're going to have five litters of babies all right where if you have less females less babies so you tend to take out the males um the iucn red list founded in 1948 maintains the red list equals a uh, list of threatened species also the the iucn educates the public advises governments assesses world heritage sites which are actually really cool to visit if you ever get the opportunity. Red list determines conservation status off of the population size, uh, degree of specialization, distribution, reproductive potential, geographic range and fragmentation, quality of habit, trophic level, probability of extinction. Um, on the red list criteria, there's extinct, last individual is believed dead, Sorry, man, we haven't seen one of your kind in a while. You're probably on the extinct list. The extinct in the wild only survives in non-original environments. So basically they moved, like you might have been a wolf in Yellowstone, but you all died out. But they moved some of you off to Canada, where now you're surviving. Or they moved some of you off to a zoo. Or they're growing you in a lab. You know, that's extinct in the wild. But you ain't growing in your natural environment anymore. 
critically endangered, extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. So yeah, you're looking pretty chance of you surviving are pretty slim. Uh, endangered, very high risk of extinction in the wild. It's still where we're really going to apply a lot of effort because we don't want you to get to the critical status. So um, vulnerable, high risk of extinction in the wild. Um, we're concerned big time. Um, near threatened, close to qualifying or likely qualifying in the future. We got our eyes on you, you know. Least concern, widespread and abundant. We're probably probably ah uh, probably harvesting you because look, buddy, you're a dime a dozen. We can use you. You're replaceable. Uh, data deficient, not enough data to really make an assessment, or non-evaluators just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. So, yep, that's the different ones. So that's three three folks. Thank you.